Welcome. This is Dr. Michio Kaku, Professor of Theoretical Physics at the City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and this is Exploration. Every week on Exploration, we discuss the fascinating world of science and its impact on society. And today, leading off, we're going to summarize some of the top stories in science. Our lead story today is, well, May 21st came and May 21st went. And if you're listening to this radio program, you know that you're still alive and that Doomsday did not take place on May 21st. So hopefully you did not sell the house, you did not quit your job, and you did not get divorced because you'll live to see the day after May 21st. And then we'll say a few things about the history. There's a long history of making predictions of doomsday in Christendom, and we'll say a few things about 2012 as well. And then mark November 8th on your calendar. That is not doomsday. However, a gigantic rock about 1,300 feet across, about the size of a battleship, will come right between the Earth and the Moon. In fact, it'll be so big, you'll be able to see it whizzing right overhead on the night of November 8th. So mark that down, because this is the first time in history that we've had advance warning of an object that big coming that close to the planet Earth. And then we'll give you an update as to what's happening with the Fukushima reactor. This week, the TEPCO utility made an astounding revelation. They now admit that the damage to the core was much more extensive than previously thought, and at least that in Unit 1, there was perhaps a 100% core melt. In other words, the feared meltdown actually took place in Unit 1, in various stages, Unit 2 and 3, but they caught it in the nick of time. That's how close we came to a tragedy beyond human comprehension at the Fukushima site, and we're still not out of the woods, perhaps 30 years, to clean up that mess in Fukushima. And then we're going to bring on a special guest today. We're going to run part two of our interview with Patrick Tucker. He's the senior editor of the Futurist magazine, the flagship magazine of the World Future Society. And we are going to continue our discussion about the future. Jobs. What about space travel? What about robots, telecommunications, biotechnology, medicine? In fact, all these things are covered in my late book, Physics of the Future, which sailed on to the New York Times bestseller list for over a month. In fact, it was in the top 10 books, nonfiction books sold in the United States. It is by far the number one science book in the United States at the present time, Physics of the Future. And I'm proud to say that many community and public radio stations are using the book as a premium to raise funds to keep their signal loud and clear on the air. <clears throat> well, let's just jump right into some of the top stories of the past week. May 21st came, May 21st went, but it's not the first time that mystics and different kinds of would-be self-proclaimed prophets have declared doomsday. In fact, if you look at the history of Christendom, there have been uncountable attempts to calculate the day of the second coming, the day of Judgment Day. And in fact, in the United States, perhaps the most important event happened in 1833, an event that actually affects us even today. In 1833, there was a gigantic meteor shower that was seen over the United States. It freaked out tens of thousands of people who then began to say that it's a sign of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, the Millerite movement got off the ground because a certain pastor by the name of Miller said that the meteor shower of 1833 is nothing but a warning sign, a warning sign of the second coming, which is going to be in 1845. And so the Millerite movement 
had a tremendous popularity. Tens of thousands of people in the Americas began to say that, yes, now is the time to sell the house, sell the farm. Now is the time to quit your day job and prepare to get, well, beamed up into outer space with Jesus Christ. Well, the Millerite movement peaked at around 1845 with tens of thousands of people anxiously awaiting the time when they can be beamed into outer space. Well, 1845 came and 1845 went. As a consequence, the Millerite movement was disgraced, but it split into several huge chunks. The Millerite movement was so big that it began to create splinter movements, which even exist even today. One splinter movement is the Seventh-day Adventists. Another split from the Millerite movement is the Jehovah's Witnesses. And it turns out that these split-offs were very careful not to set the exact date for Doomsday. Because when Doomsday comes and goes, then your prophet is disgraced and your movement splits into pieces. And so the Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses, two offshoots of the Millerite movement, are very careful even today not to set the precise day of doomsday. However, there was a third chunk of the Millerite movement, and they actually made several, not one, but several predictions of doomsday. Each time doomsday came and went and the movement splintered, but these fragments then began to predict the day of doomsday. Well, this kept going on and on and on until the last fragment of this branch of the Millerite movement settled in Texas. In fact, settled in a town called Waco, Texas. It was a very small movement, but then it was energized when a young man joined that movement called David Koresh. And so this movement then began to have a fresh breath of new vigor with David Koresh, a very charismatic young man. Unfortunately, he had a run-in with the FBI. And as a consequence, the Millerite movement, the last fragment of it apparently, committed mass suicide. And one of the most horrific events in recent U.S. history, the attempt by the FBI to rein in this last branch Davidian group ended in tragedy with men women and even babies burned alive and so in other words things have consequences when you begin to predict doomsday and you begin to predict that you will be beamed into outer space people will in fact commit mass suicide as what happened with the last branch of the Millerite movement which engaged in self-immolation unfortunately ending the Branch Davidian movement. Well, however, there is a date that you could put on the calendar, a date that's been verified by modern science, and that date is November 8th of this year. Usually, when a gigantic meteor comes whizzing by the planet Earth, we have no warning. There's no early warning system, and so it whizzes by the Earth, or it actually hits the Earth. We have no way of knowing when it's going to happen. This time by accident in 2005, amateurs picked up a dot in outer space. They've been tracking it now accurately since April of last year, and it is huge. This is an asteroid 1,300 feet across. It is the size of an aircraft carrier. And if it would hit the Earth, it would be a city buster. It wouldn't destroy life on the Earth like what happened 65 million years ago. That rock was six miles across. However, this rock, 1,300 feet across, can do a considerable amount of damage. It is a city buster. It could wipe out New York, Los Angeles, London, if it were to impact on one of our great cities. But it will miss. Now, what happens after that, we don't know. Computer simulations of the trajectory show that within a 100 years, it will not hit the Earth. But after that, we simply don't know. Now, the lesson here is that we don't have an early warning system. We found this by accident. And so we find out about these near misses after the near misses have taken place. And that's unacceptable. 
Congress should really send space probes into outer space, which can give us real-time analyses of comets and meteors as they come whizzing by the planet Earth, which we now know are more common than previously thought. And also, and also, I'd like to give you an update as to what's happening with the Fukushima reactor. First of all, the head of TEPCO, Tokyo Electric, quit the other day. And some people think it was long overdue. First of all, TEPCO, the utility, has a long history of cutting back on expenses, on trying to take the minimum steps necessary to make sure that the reactors are safe. They've engaged in a cover-up of previous accidents. And this particular president, well, when the accident took place, he was AWOL. That's right, he disappeared. He said, oh, i got to go to the hospital. And he wasn't even around to take control of the reactor as it progressed into a meltdown. And that's the word now being used. Up to this week, there was still speculation as to exactly how much of the cores were damaged. It was estimated that Unit 1 had maybe 75% core damage. We didn't know for sure. And what does that mean anyway? Unit 2, perhaps maybe 30% core damage. These were words used thrown around, but now we have more precise figures coming out this week. We now realize the accidents were much more severe than previously thought. We now realize that the cores were fully uncovered, 100% uncovered. That's a no-no. Under no circumstance is a nuclear engineer allowed to uncover the core because within a few hours it begins to melt. And within about 15 hours or so, it is fully melted. And that's what happened at least at Unit 1. Now that workers can actually get onto the site for brief periods of time and measure the actual level of water in some of the reactors, we now know that there was a full-scale meltdown, at least in Unit 1, possibly in Units 2 and 3 as well. Water levels went all the way down to zero. As a consequence, the core began to heat up. It reached 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Melting took place. In fact, we suspect it was a 100% core melt in Unit 1. The melted uranium, sometimes abbreviated as corium, then begins to plunge onto the bottom of the reactor vessel where we have a capsule made out of six inches of carbon steel. But apparently, the melted core went right through six inches of carbon steel and plunged onto the floor of the containment structure itself. This is not supposed to happen. We're talking about a breach of containment. Now, this solves certain mysteries. One mystery was that if the vessels held in all three reactors, then how come radioactive water keeps spilling out? Where is the radiation coming from if not from direct contact with melted uranium? And the second mystery was as they keep dumping water onto the reactor, where's the water going? How come it's leaking out? They were not able to stabilize the reactor because every time they dump water onto the core, it leaks out somewhere. There is a breach someplace in the containment structure. Well, all this was great speculation, but now this week, TEPCO finally owns up and says, yes, it was a full-scale meltdown. 100% of the core, at least in Unit 1, is thoroughly melted, probably went right through six inches of carbon steel, and has plunged now to the bottom of the containment. That would explain the mystery of why the water keeps disappearing, because the vessel itself has gaping holes in it caused by melting uranium, and it explains, obviously, why there's so much radiation to begin with because water is in direct contact with molten uranium. Then the last question is, well, why didn't it go to a full-scale catastrophe? And the answer is that, well, around 15 hours after the accident began, we now believe that there was a full-scale meltdown, at least at Unit 1, possibly at Units 2 and 3, but eventually they dumped seawater. Seawater, and by the way, the utility resisted 
resisted recommendations from the government to initiate this last-ditch maneuver because it would destroy the reactors. Dumping seawater onto the reactors would make them into pieces of junk. That is, you would lose the investment completely. TEPCO fought that recommendation, but the government says no. The reactor is progressing out of control, and we have to dump seawater into the core. That's what stopped the accident just before a catastrophe beyond comprehension. At Chernobyl, we saw what happens when you have a hydrogen and steam explosion that blows the top right off the reactor, releasing perhaps maybe 25% of the core inventory into the air. We came very close to that scenario times three, times three at the Fukushima site. But because seawater was dumped onto the core at the very last minute, that stopped the reaction from progressing any further. Now, as you can imagine, the situation is stable in the same sense that a ticking time bomb is also stable. The slightest little thing could set it off because of the delicate state of the cores, i.e., they are gone. They are melted. What could happen is a small earthquake or a pipe break or human failure. Any of these things could cause a loss of water, and because the fuel is already melted, it wouldn't take much to start up the melting again with the loss of cooling water. At that point, temperatures again could reach 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit easily, and at that point, we're talking about a steam or gas explosion which will blow the entire containment structure apart. At that point, you have three full-scale meltdowns and breach of containment. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen. The best case scenario is that, well, maybe within six to nine months, maybe by January of next year, they could go to what, what is called cold shutdown, that's when the temperature goes below the boiling point of water. So water is no longer boiling off, creating more problems of radiation contamination. So maybe coal shutdown next year. At that point, the pumps begin to kick in. And we don't have to rely on the manual injection of fresh water. We'll have pumps automatically circulating water in a closed loop. Hopefully sometime next year, will be in coal shutdown and the pumps will start again. And then after that, following what happened at Three Mile Island, we have to put cameras inside the core to photograph the state of melting and the damage to the bottom of the reactors. Once we know the geometry of the melted uranium, we have to bring in hacksaws. That's right, hacksaws to hacksaw the core into pieces so that we can then bring each piece out of the water and begin the process of sealing the entire facility in concrete. That's right, it'll be sealed in concrete. That's the plan of the Hitachi Corporation. The Hitachi Corporation estimates 30 years for that cleanup operation. Remember that Three Mile Island took 14 years. Chernobyl, that accident is still going on. Out of sight, out of mind, right? Yeah, well, it's still going on. The core is still melting into the earth, and that was 25 years ago, almost to the month. And so we have this situation where we're going to have this ongoing agony for 30 years as piece by piece they begin to clean up the core, take it out, dump it someplace at a nuclear waste dump, and seal the whole thing in concrete. Now I'd like to introduce our special guest for today. We're running part two of our interview with Patrick Tucker of the World Future Society. And once again, talking about the future, my latest book is called Physics of the Future. It's based on interviews with 300 of the world's top scientists, including Mr. Tucker. And it talks about the future of jobs, the economy, robots, biotechnology, medicine, telecommunications, space travel, in other words, your life and the life of your descendants in the coming decades, as told to me by the scientists who are actually inventing the future in their laboratories. 
And I'm proud to say that the book sailed on to the New York Times bestseller list. It was in the top 10 books sold of all nonfiction books in the United States for over a month. And I'd like to thank all those people that have bought the book and supported exploration. And many public and community radio stations will be offering Physics of the Future as a premium for their fundraising drive. And so once again, our special guest today is Patrick Tucker of the World Future Society. We're running part two of our interview concerning the future. Patrick, speaking about the future, won't we have the Internet in our contact lens so we simply blink and go online? And also, won't cars literally drive themselves using GPS? Well, uh, self-driving cars are actually already here. uh, In 2007, the uh, third competition of the DARPA Grand Challenge, they uh, hold a self-driving car competition um, from time to time since 2005. They showed that a car without a driver could navigate 60 miles of urban area in less than six hours while obeying all the traffic laws and and regulations. Um, The winner was a joint effort by Carnegie Mellon University and General Motors. So 60 miles in six hours doesn't sound like much, but it's a huge improvement over the original self-driving robot that MIT was working with in in 1979, which needed six hours to travel just one meter. You can see how far we've come since then. Um, There's a a lot of firms like Boston Dynamics and uh, and Stanford, and, of course, uh, iRobot, uh, which is uh, Rodney Brooks' corporation that makes self-driving uh, vehicles to some extent, and they're used right now in, uh, by the military mostly in an experimental setting, not so much in a battlefield. But um, this is something that the military is looking to do with drone technology, is uh, leverage it oh, less towards um, sort of combat operations and more towards transport, things like that, and supply side things. Um, so I think you're going to see um, self-driving cars moving objects and moving supplies in a civilian setting long before you're going to see cars actually driving people because cars can move objects and, and, and supplies uh, without a human driver pretty easily. But when you tell the car's computer that it's all of a sudden got to think about the needs and um, all, of the, all of the different weaknesses of the, of the pushy, demanding little organism in the back seat that is the human, you increase the complexity level of that job uh, exponentially. Okay, so if cars begin to drive themselves, uh, what about the house uh, when you come home? What's the home going to look like? Are you going to be able to talk to the walls and basically have the walls become intelligent? Uh, well, this is something that a lot of uh, uh, different um, labs have, have been looking at how to make, what does it mean to have a smart house? And uh, a lot of people say yes, that what you, what you want in a smart house is a house that interacts with you through sensors and um, through different interfaces that you're coming in contact with. So um, you walk into a bathroom, for instance, and um, your bathroom mirror reads a lot of your, uh, reads your weight, but it's also looking at your protein levels, your sodium levels, um, your vitamin levels, and it's going to give you a recommendation about what you should eat over the course of the day, and that's before you even leave the house. All that information is uh, something that you're, your mirror or your sink or um, your bathroom floor is able to pick up and and tell you about. Um, But there are other ideas for a smart house, too. The Georgia Tech smart house is one where um, it's mostly for for older people, but um, it records what you do as you go about your day. So if you forgot where you put something or if you need help, um, the house picks up on it, and it can show you a little movie of where you put the object that you laid down somewhere, And if you need help, then it picks up on that as well, and it can contact your family or it can contact a a, a medical service provider and let them know. They can even monitor the levels of pollen and other particulate matter in your house so that you know that the particulate matter in your house or the pollen is a little high and you should go outside for a walk. Okay. Now, some people think that when you relax, you'll simply put on uh, contact lenses, which will have the Internet, and you'll be able to simply download any movie. Uh, download what's happening at the office. You can word process just in the 
privacy of your room because you have basically the entire Internet in your contact lens. Could you elaborate? Um, this is uh, also a it's, a... it's a really interesting idea that you can put um, a, a contact lens or some sort of uh, special glasses on and just sort of envelop yourself in another world and... Um, no one is quite sure yet how to do it. There's University of Washington uh, prototype design for um, LEDs embedded in a contact lens that you can look at, and you can sort of get light displays. But um, making the image that small is some, still something that's really hard. Um, I think that first you're going to see special glasses that you can put on and get a sort of visual readout of, and we're actually going to be hopefully debuting a set of those at the conference uh, in July. Uh, in Vancouver. They're, it's a Motorola headset, and uh, it's got a little sort of viewfinder-type uh, apparatus on the side, and you look through it, and uh, you can watch movies sort of play out like that. But um, in the future, I don't see any reason necessarily why you wouldn't be able to take a, a pair of contact lenses that had um, the same technology as you see in a flat screen, but on a much smaller scale, possibly on a nano scale, and uh, stick them in your eyes with the a pair of headphones, and uh, be watching a movie while it looks like you're paying very close attention to whoever you're talking to. And it would be somewhat similar to the holodeck of Star Trek, or maybe even the Matrix, uh, being able to recreate objects all around you. You couldn't touch them, of course, because uh, they're just images inside your contact lens, but you could uh, resurrect the whole Roman Empire uh, right in your living room, right? Well, you 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 could you would uh, you might need to wear sort of special um, gloves that would be measuring your hand movements. But uh, this is also something that people are are beginning to work with now. And uh, uh, one of the uses of these of these special uh, 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 um, how do you how do you say um they're um, uh, gloves that sense touch and. Uh, they use that data the way you, uh, when you operate a mouse, collects data about the movement of the mouse, and it turns it into a, a display change. Um, there, there are gloves that do the same thing, and people use them in New York during disco shows to make interesting light shows and things like that. And um, I think that there'll be tremendous demand for them. The technology isn't particularly advanced at all. Um, and one of the great things about it is it gets, it gets you out of your chair. So you can operate, I mean, the entire world sort of becomes your your interface. So you can uh, create graphics and create displays and um, manipulate data and open email with a, a wave of your hand wherever you are, and it gets you up and moving. So I think there'll be tremendous demand for them, and I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing um, those sorts of objects on the market fairly soon. Well, Patrick, we have to take a short break. But after the break, I want to ask you about the smart toilet a toilet which uses chips in order to detect proteins emitted from a cancer colony of maybe 100 cancer cells, maybe 10, 20 years before a tumor forms. And so, in other words, the word tumor could literally disappear from the English language once we computerize our toilet. So, effortlessly, your bathroom will be able to analyze all your bodily molecules and proteins and enzymes and alert you about cancer and other kinds of diseases years, decades, before they actually occur. Welcome back to Exploration. Once again, this is Dr. Michio Kaku, Professor of Theoretical Physics at the City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and this is the second half of Exploration. As we mentioned last week, we ran part one of our interview with Patrick Tucker, of the World Future Society, and we are talking about the future. In fact, my latest book is Physics of the Future, which goes all the way out to the year 2100. What about jobs? What about the economy? What about automation, robots? What about biotechnology, telecommunications, space travel? I've interviewed over 300 of the world's top scientists for BBC Television, the Discovery Channel, the Science Channel, and of course, Exploration, to give you the most authentic look at the future. So once again, with us today to guide us to the future is Patrick Tucker of the World Future Society, one of 300 people that I interviewed for my latest book, 
Physics of the Future. And thank you so much for supporting the book and exploration. The book was on the New York Times bestseller list for over a month. And so once again, this is part two of our interview with Patrick Tucker. We ran part one last week. Well, Patrick, where we last left off, we were talking about the smart toilet, which in the future may pick up proteins and enzymes emitted from 100 cancer cells in a cancer colony maybe 20 years before you come down with pancreatic cancer. That could really affect the way we view cancer, right? Yes, I, and in that instance, I guess that the sensor would be looking at, at basically your stool sample and letting you know, um, reminding you of what, what you've eaten and what's inside your body right after the fact. And um, this is the thing that we're discovering about, about a lot of the illnesses that um, we treat and we run across on a daily basis is that um, they're with us for a long time. And um, once you, when your method of detecting that stuff is to go into a doctor's office once a year or twice a year, then you really increase the chances of missing something. But when you can, um, if you've got a device in your house that can uh, take those sorts of measurements uh, for you constantly and alert you the second there's an abnormality, you can catch it much quicker. And uh, this is the sort of stuff that we're going to use to be much healthier. And this is part of the reason why many futurists predict that um, we're going to weed out these illnesses like cancer, um, like perhaps even Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, and we're going to live and be much healthier in the future and live a great deal longer. Some people say that we can live perhaps as long as 300 years uh, with the aid of technology and various nanotechnologies. Um, so we'll be living much longer than we are today. I think that the natural lifespan of the human body pushed to its furthest extent um, without a technology to um, sort of augment human life functioning is about 150 years, but that's not necessarily the limit when you bring in technologies like nanotechnology. Okay, well, let's uh, finish up the train of thought that we had before on cancer. Uh, I heard that recently you can put DNA chips in your bathroom mirror so that you blow on the mirror. You just say, ha, to the mirror. It picks up water droplets and looks for a mutated P53 gene, which is implicated in 50% of all common cancers. And instead of waiting weeks, uh, within a matter of minutes, your bathroom mirror will tell you whether or not you have lung cancer. So this is going to change everything, right? Every time you go to the bathroom without even thinking about it, you just do your normal <laughs> daily affairs. Your, your bathroom will tell you that you have to watch out for lung cancer in the coming years. Uh, right. So you um, you've got a, a a bathroom a bathroom mirror that you're interacting with. You've got also a scale. Um, you possibly have items in your house that you drink out of that are um, collecting different samples from your body that way. And uh, yeah, you're going to know what's going on in your body a lot sooner than uh, than anybody else. And this is going to, I think, really empower people to take a different direction at their health because. Um, you know, your, the warning from your bathroom mirror not to smoke or, um, you know, to, to regulate your diet a little bit better or to get exercise is useless if you don't follow the advice. But with that daily reminder, I think you're going to start seeing um, changes in behavior in people. And uh, you're going to start seeing people getting more regular checkups because, I mean, you don't necessarily have early onset cancer because your bathroom mirror tells you so. so. But if your bathroom mirror tells you so, you're much more likely to go in and, and get a regular screen and um, that's what's going to help catch the cancer early and catch, uh, you know, other, other diseases and abnormalities early. So um, it's, it's really about um, sensors that we already have, um, making them, using them in different places and um, collecting data about the human body on a constant daily basis and then leveraging that information to um, help people know what's going on with them a lot sooner so they can take preventative action a lot earlier. And that does change everything. That oh. in improves the human lifespan. Okay. And in, talk about increasing the lifespan of humans. We talked about cancers. Now let's talk about organ replacement and growing organs of the body so that we will not die of organ failure. 
So right now at Wake Forest University, scientists there can take cells of your own body and grow noses, ears, skin, blood, blood vessels, heart valves, bladders, windpipes now, and uh, maybe even livers and the pancreas in the coming years. So you, do you foresee a time in the coming decades when we're going to have a human body shop, and as organs begin to wear out, we'll simply replace them, and that alone will begin to increase the human lifespan? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, in, uh, earlier this year at the TED conference in California, um, a doctor brought out a device and was able to actually, in talking to a large auditorium of people, print a human kidney on, on stage. So, I mean, they, they printed it the same way when you, when you print a document, you're layering ink on top of paper. This device layers cells on top of cells in a pattern that, um, in the end, manifests in a, a kidney that could be um, surgically implanted in someone tomorrow. It's not necessarily going to match that person's DNA because that was just an example. But um, this technology really is already here. And so what you see is a lot of people that before would have trouble getting organ donations, um, suddenly their lifespan and, and uh, their health outcomes really open up tremendously. But this is something that, though not in wide use, really is in the present already. Um, it's really marvelous stuff. Uh, we're able to do this because we have a much better understanding about how, um, how to link these sorts of, um, how to create genetically and, and, and blood friendly organs for immediate implantation. Um, we've gotten much better at that. We're, we're much better at creating objects that the body isn't going to reject and um, helping people through the process of getting their body to accept um, uh, uh, foreign organs and things like that. And um, we're much better at using biological material to create more biological material that is useful. And uh, that only increases in the next 10 to 20 years and helps us live a lot longer. Okay, Patrick, we talked about the smart house, computers of the future. We talked about medicine and how your bathroom will have more computer power than a modern university hospital. And now let's talk about robots. Uh, we are brainwashed by Hollywood into thinking that thinking, scheming, devious robots are just around the corner Skynet is going to become conscious, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, the robot, is going to be unleashed on humanity. But tell us a little bit about robots today, where we really are with respect to creating automata, machines that can think by themselves. And let's now think about the next 50 to 100 years. What are your thoughts? Well, I think that, um, you know, robot development is, is proceeding um, – a lot faster than many people people thought it would. But if you talk to roboticists, one of their main concerns is that people have <laughs> put a lot, uh, put too much faith in these devices to act autonomously. Because as you pointed out, they are um, they're wondrous machines and they're able to do a lot of things a lot better than they used to. But they are still dumb machines. Um, there's two tracks of robot development in many ways. There's um, uh, the type of robot or, or artificial intelligence that you saw on Jeopardy with Watson, and this is a, this is a computer that's been programmed um, to execute a really difficult command, which is playing Jeopardy and understanding and parsing nuances of, in language and understanding a bit about the way humans speak and taking that information and dialoguing with um, a huge storehouse of information to basically beat humans at what is considered an extremely human game, which is Jeopardy. Um, and as uh, everyone who saw uh, Watson win on Jeopardy knows that uh, the, the performance was really quite remarkable and represents um, a huge improvement over where artificial intelligence was a couple of years ago. But this is still a limited artificial intelligence. This, Watson's not necessarily going to compete with you for your job. Um, after uh, Deep Blue, which was um, Watson's predecessor, another IBM artificial intelligence uh, computer uh, program, beat Gary Kasparov in chess in the 80s, um, the literary critic George Plimpton had a wonderful observation. He said, yeah, that thing's great at chess, but it can't hail a cab to get out of the hotel room. It, uh, it's not going to help you with a bad marriage. And the same is true uh, with Watson. Um, so that's a particular type of artificial intelligence, and it's limited to performing 
um, perhaps extremely complex tasks really well, but it may not know as much about the real world as it seems to or that we think that it does. Now, Patrick, this Watson computer, uh, wasn't it so stupid that it didn't even know that it won? You couldn't congratulate it? You couldn't say, wow, you just won this contest against two humans. Isn't this basically just a very sophisticated adding machine? Well, I think that you can certainly say that it's um, a lot cooler than an adding machine. But, no, it couldn't understand the concept of winning. It's not going to know meaningfully what it means to sort of um, conquer this particular conquest. There's no consequence for it. It just executes a program. So, yes, I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic adding machine. The more interesting work in, in robotics and artificial intelligence, from my perspective, is actually taking place in Japan, where they're, um, I, where, from which I just returned. They're spending a lot of time um, trying to create robots that interact with people and in many ways do a lot of the functions in three-dimensional space that people do. Um, now, the robots right now are still extremely rudimentary. They've got a robot that can fold laundry, and they've got um, robots that can, can do um, interesting traditional Japanese dances, and it's still really rudimentary, but um, that avenue of robotic development where you're forcing the robot to interact with three-dimensional space, I think is going to be the much more lucrative one, because that's how our brain developed. We developed our brain to um, perceive patterns in three-dimensional space, avoid threats, and seek out opportunities. And so um, in Japan, one thing that they're really focused on is getting robots to um, sort of navigate the same things because they have a very elderly population and they hope that robots will be able to help elderly people in their homes to to do more things. Um, But that avenue of research is yielding some really remarkable uh, results. These are still, of course, dumb machines, but you can see them learning more about the actual world than I think you would see in in a machine like Watson, which has been programmed with all the information that it has. Okay, well, let's uh, talk about these two kinds of robots. Uh, First of all, the first type of robot is sometimes called an expert system. It Mm -hmm. has a lot of facts, just a lot of facts. It can't reason. It can't come to conclusions. It can't do anything that we associate with thinking, but it's very good at correlating facts and giving you answers for well-defined questions. So some people think that one day we're going to have RoboDoc or RoboLawyer. We'll simply talk to the wall, an image, an animated image of a doctor or lawyer will appear. You'll answer, you'll ask questions in a stylized format, and 95, 99% of the time, common questions will get an accurate answer. So do you foresee a time when the descendants of Watson eventually become our expert companions that can answer questions like in medicine, in law, and things like that? Well, I think that a lot of people are already using uh, um, search engines like Google as their expert companion. And uh, uh, this is a form of, in many ways, an expert system that's just an algorithm. The uh, the data that it's giving is uh, data that's been human-supplied, but um, we still trust it as though it were, uh, um, you know, uh, checked and, and, and uh, the result of a, of a thought process that is objective, when, of course, it isn't. So I think that... Um, there's a lot of room for different expert systems to perhaps make many different professions uh, obsolete as we understand them today. Um, these expert systems, they, you, they're also sometimes called uh, narrow artificial intelligences because they, can, uh, they are artificially intelligent, but only along uh, in a very narrow definition. It, uh, they're only good at one particular thing. Um, they are incapable of stuff like creativity or um, uh, thinking sort of outside of the box. So um, you might be able to use them as a, as a reference, and they'll be a fantastic reference, and we can, uh, 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 this will uh, save a lot of time that we would otherwise spend looking things up or, or searching through, for instance, Google search engine results for the, for the correct answer. Um, that process is going to get a lot easier because of these expert systems. But... Um, they're not going – if you ask them to sort of speculate about the meaning of something, they might not give you the answer that's going to be optimal. I think that um, at least for the next uh, 50 years, you're still going to need to take that data and ask a real expert about um, 
what it might mean and how they might use it or, or how you might use it uh, most productively in order to get your best answer. Yeah, some people think that perhaps 90% of the visits to the doctor and to the hospital are just for small, little, menial things, but they rack up a huge bill when you sim simply add up all the hours devoted to it, and that's where RoboDoc and RoboLawyer come in, not for the specialized cases involving very sophisticated use of surgery and high-tech, but just for the day-to-day -day coughs and the day-to-day -day fevers and the day-to-day -day things that drive many people to the hospital and to the doctor's office. And now speaking about the second kind of robot, you touched upon something. The Japanese population is aging faster than any other population on the planet Earth right now. Birth rates are plunging down to about 1.2 children per family. Almost no immigration into Japan is taking place. And so aren't we seeing basically an enormous push into robotics to create robot nurses robot nurses to take care of a very aging population. Yes, yes, you are. And uh, you, nursing is one uh, potential use of these robots. Uh, in the interim, I think they're looking at them more sort of like companions, sort of like, like maids. But ultimately, they will have to perform very low-level um, sort of medical, medical tasks. And uh, the... Robotic development and robotic research in Japan is different from the United States in a couple of respects. On the one hand, as you mentioned, there's tremendous demographic need. They are the oldest population on the planet demographically, with the exception of Monaco, which doesn't exactly count, I don't think. Um, and so there's tremendous need for um, uh, servants in, in houses that can do little things that people who are old used to be able to do fairly well but can't anymore. The uh, work situation in Japan is such that um, people are really expected to be to work. There's no uh, – working from home isn't something socially that's nearly as acceptable as it is in the United States. But more importantly, um, robotic development in Japan is funded not by the military as it is in the United States. I mean, there are private companies that do robotic development in the States, but a lot of the money going into that development is military money. In Japan, a lot of that money comes from grants, it comes from the government, and uh, but not through the military, and it comes uh, from big corporations. And so the field of um, robotic research is open in a different way. I talked to a robotic researcher over there. Uh, his name is Dylan Gass. He works with the um, uh, Advanced Telecommunications Research Institute. And he pointed out that they have um, a very different legal system over there as well. So you can actually put people and robots together, like actual civilians, regular people that like go out and walk around malls and, and, and drive cars. And you know, you and I, we're going to have a much much higher likelihood of being able to interact with a robot in Japan than we would in the United States. Because here, if you want to put a robot, for instance, in a mall, you need a lot of permits, and you could get sued if uh, one of the actuators misfires and you know, you've got a hydraulic pump going, you know, moving towards somebody's head at, at, at 200 miles an hour, that's a lawsuit. Whereas in Japan, people are, are much more likely to, um, I mean, the legal environment is such that you don't have to worry as much about lawsuits. So they're running a really interesting experiment over there where they have uh, a bunch of robots in an Osaka shopping mall. They just concluded this experiment in December. And if you walk through the mall, the robot takes a look at, how fast you're walking, um, whether you're lingering by the windows, whether you're lingering by the map, and what your body language seems to be. They pick up all this information from a network of sensors that are placed around this particular area, and based on the information that it receives, it makes a determination about whether or not you're safe to approach or whether you're in a hurry. And if you're safe to approach, the robot walks up to you and gives you directions about um, or makes a recommendation for a shop that you might like to see. It's exactly the sort of thing that you wouldn't find in the United States for legal reasons, but in Japan you can run an experiment like that, and it's really quite fascinating. And this is why I think the greatest strides that we're going to see in robotics are going to be based out of Japan in the next 10 or 20 years. Well, Patrick, we talked about uh, robots, and now let's talk about science fiction. Sometime in the future, some people think that robots may take over. Maybe they'll become smarter than us. Maybe they'll put us in zoos. Maybe they'll throw peanuts at us, make us dance behind bars, just like we make bears dance behind bars. Other people say that, well, let them take over. They are our children. It's the natural progress of evolution, survival of the fittest. 
And if they're fitter than us, well, they are our children. And if they put us to rest, so be it. Well, what are your thoughts? You probably get a lot of different thoughts from all directions. First of all, tell us what is the singularity and what do you think is going to actually happen? Well, the, the singularity is, uh, is a term from, from physics. Um, we're pointing to an event horizon where um, uh, because of an accelerating event, there's a, a, uh, a point where you can multiply something uh, over and over and over again, and for a, a, a number of cycles in that multiplication, you get very low numbers, but um, at, uh, you reach a point where the mul- multiplying a, not, a number by uh, over and over again, you, get, you suddenly get really large numbers. And this concept has been applied to, uh, that's in math, and in physics it's, it's an event horizon. It's, it's a really complex uh, idea. But it's been applied to an idea uh, of technological acceleration. So our uh, technological information, um, according to thinkers like Ray Kurzweil um, and before him, Werner Vinge, um, our, the amount of technological information that we have about the, the world, they argue, doesn't um, proceed by way of addition. We don't, like, add uh, development on top of development, it actually proceeds, they say, exponentially. So every technological development produces, say, five. And then each of those produces, say, another five little breakthroughs that we don't recognize as such right away or don't recognize as connected, but they are. And they argue that because of that, the amount of technological innovation that we are going to see over the course of the next 20 years will be equal to the amount of technological innovation that we perceived in the last 100 years which was equal to the amount of technological innovation we perceived in the last 10,000 years before that. So all of a sudden we're going to, all technological development is going to start to proceed much, much faster. It's going to be very hard for us to control. And Ray Kurzweil predicts that um, in the year 2045, this will result in an explosion in intelligence and we'll have machines and artificial intelligence that is far fast, far smarter than the entire human race, far faster than the entire human race. And um, he predicts that because this artificial intelligence will be a reflection and a creation of the, inf- artifi- uh, of the human race, that we're going to be able to use it to do amazing things. It's going to help us to um, basically to conquer mortality, to, um, for all intents and purposes, live forever, and um, basically do whatever we want, vanquish starvation, vanquish um, uh, deprivation of energy, vanquish all the problems that we associate with being alive today and um, live a completely new existence unseen in human history. Well, what are your thoughts? Some people think that we're going to have the Terminator, that robots are going to push us aside. That's, of course, a very common theme in science fiction. Other people think that, well, maybe we'll live with robots like an iRobot. We just have to be able to make sure that rogue robots don't take over like that's why we have to have Harrison Ford. <laughs> um, but what are your thoughts? Well, I, I'm uh, optimistic but skeptical. I, at this point, um, the notion that a robot, uh, an artificial intelligence would take over civilization implies a breakthrough in robotics that hasn't happened or a breakthrough in artificial intelligence that hasn't happened. I have to look at sort of what exists today, and I see them as machines that are getting ever better and ever smarter, but are still incapable of making even the most basic decisions about their own health and well-being and the events in their lives, much less making decisions on behalf of the entire human race. Um, There is an argument, uh, and I think it's a credible one, that our innovation levels do uh, expand exponentially, and that is something to think about. But um, I am not at this point afraid of a robot or an artificial intelligence taking over human civilization because the roboticists that I talk to, the people that are actually involved in like the hardware of making this stuff interact in the outside world, one of whom is Rodney Brooks at MIT, told me that he's not worried about something like that happening for the next 500 years. And so I'm a bit more likely to trust his opinion on that necessarily than someone who says that an artificial intelligence would kill us all. For the most part, I think that in the next 30 to 40 to 50 years, we're going to use technology to do amazing things. 
to expand our lifespan, to live a lot healthier, to get off of fossil fuels and things that are bad for the environment, and to live a lot smarter. And it really will seem miraculous. But I'm not worried at this point about artificial intelligence telling me what to do. Um, because I have problems with technology all day where I'm uh, interacting with different computer programs and fixing errors that they make. So uh, I'll worry when I begin to see that stop happening, I think. Okay. Well, you mentioned uh, the future. You mentioned energy for the future. And uh, let's say a few things about space travel now. Uh, you mentioned earlier in the discussion that the Japanese have a rather novel proposal for energy for the future, which combines space travel and a little bit of science fiction. Could you elaborate? Um, yes, this is a Japanese company called Shimizu. It's actually Japan's fourth largest construction company, and they're pitching uh, what would basically be the largest alternative energy project and the largest public works project in human history. Um, so it works like this. They would send robots to the moon um, with launches, and on the moon, these robots would construct solar photovoltaic panels out of um, silicon and, and other minerals that are um, present in lunar dirt, but not in, uh, in very large deposits. And with these solar panels, they would make a belt that goes around the lunar equator, um, so one portion of it would always be facing the sun, and it would be collecting energy, and that energy would beam back to Earth in either a laser or a microwave, and uh, it would be sufficient to um, run all of human civilization. So part of the thinking behind this is that solar collection in space is about 10 times easier than it is on Earth, because in space there is, of course, and on the moon there is, of course, no atmosphere. There's no clouds. There's no ozone. There's no um, little particles to get in the way of the uh, panel collecting the sun's energy. So space is really the best place to collect energy. The problem is that because that we don't live in space, so we can't use it there. So it has to get to Earth in some way. So if you beam it down to Earth in a laser or a microwave, you lose most of what you've beamed. But as long as you're collecting enough, um, you can still get enough to Earth to um, theoretically at least run all of human civilization. It's a really amazing idea, and uh, they've spent a lot of time working out how, how it is possible. Um, it requires a lot of breakthroughs. At this point, we've never built a, anything on uh, the surface of any planet using a, a robot. The Mars rover was really just sort of collecting samples. Um, but it is within the realm of possibility, uh, at least scientifically, but perhaps not politically or economically. Well, I'm afraid that's it for exploration. Once again, this is Dr. Michio Kaku. Professor of Theoretical Physics, and the special guest today was Patrick Tucker of the World Future Society, and we have been talking about the future.